So hi, everybody. My name is Michael Rosbash, and I'm an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and a professor at Brandeis University in the Department of Biology, where I've been for 40 years. So the friendship aspect of this title refers to the fact that I collaborated for more than 20 years with my colleague, Jeff Hall, who arrived at Brandeis at exactly the same time I did, and we formed a fast friendship. Jeff is almost exactly my age, and we had many interests in common, and, and Jeff had worked as a postdoc for Seymour Benzer, where he met Ron Konopka, and where he became fluent with the circadian story, and also worked on that himself in his own lab before I got involved. So that's really how this story began. And Jeff and I, as I indicated, had many uh, interests in common. Uh, one of them, two of them are shown here, uh, tobacco and alcohol. Uh, we also both were great sports fans and also played basketball for a decade together in a, in a religious obsession with a noontime basketball game during that decade. And it was after the basketball games in the locker room when everyone cools down and showers that we would exchange scientific stories and Jeff would tell me about his research in circadian rhythms that was ongoing. Uh, and it's really that uh, friendship and those tales which, which were the backdrop for the story. So to tell you just a little bit about circadian biology, uh, shown here is the wheel running activity of hamsters recorded on an old machine and, and then plotted as a function of time of day um, from the top to the bottom. And <clears throat> uh, all animals have circadian rhythms from fungi to man, and uh, they're commonly assayed in constant darkness. And the rhythms, the intrinsic rhythms of animals are not precisely 24 hours, they're about 24 hours, a little slower, a little faster, hence the term circadian or circadia, about a day. And shown here is the rhythm of these rodents in constant darkness, which is a little faster than 24 hours, as indicated by every day, starts a little bit earlier than the day before. And uh, in, in a light-dark cycle, however, as shown on the bottom panel, uh, where there's 12 hours of light and 12 hours of darkness, then the animal locks on to the light-dark cycle from the incubator as we lock on to a light-dark cycle of the external world, the set rising and setting of the sun. And temperature cycles can also do this as they accompany uh, the light-dark, the external light-dark cycle. You, you'll notice here also that these animals are nocturnal. Their activity is coincident with the night. They sleep during the daytime, and that's a characteristic of many, but not all, rodents. Now, the star of our show is Drosophila melanogaster, uh, <clears throat> shown here using a primitive counting apparatus to keep time. Uh, this was drawn by my daughter, who was a graphic designer. Uh, and, and here's uh, a picture of Drosophila locomotor activity rhythms, the analog, if you like, of the hamster's wheel running activity. And what's shown are the fact that these animals, insects, most insects in general, are active at dawn and dusk with a morning peak and an evening peak of activity, in this case in an incubator. So the morning peak coincides with the, um, the appearance of light, whereas the evening peak coincides with the transition from light to dark. And the arrows refer to the fact that the activity ramps up in advance of those discontinuous incubator transitions, indicating that there's really a timing mechanism that can anticipate the change in the external world's conditions. And anticipation is the name of the game in circadian rhythms. It's more advantageous to know what's going to happen than to know what has just happened. And so that's really uh, what the, what the uh, circadian system uh, contributes to the animals, one of several things. So genetics, <clears throat> in terms of addressing this kind of problem, has had some negative history, especially in the first half of the 20th century, um, for example, the eugenics movement, uh, in which uh, people of low intelligence, handicapped, or even of some disfavored races at the time, were, uh, were inhibited from procreating, in some cases exterminated, as you all know, from Nazi Germany. And so this movement gave behavioral genetics, gave intrinsic properties of animals or people a, a, a bad name. And, and similarly, the psychologist B.F. Skinner, who had a long and distinguished career at Harvard, had a tremendous amount of influence and believed that one could change the behavior 
of virtually every individual by simply subjecting them to constraining conditions which would then uh, change their behavior, meaning that intrinsic behavioral features were not uh, really, um, were not really uh, fixed. And so, of course, there's positive uh, history, especially in the latter half of the 20th century, that offsets that preceding negative history. We know that we can breed plants in order to, uh, in order to enhance certain characteristics. That's also true for animals, cattle, dogs, etc. And, of course, the 1973 Nobel Prize was awarded to three scientists who really worked on uh, animal behavior as intrinsic to those particular species. And so the landscape shifted, I would say, as the 20th century progressed. And so the question for you and for me um, is, is why use genetics to try and address a problem like circadian rhythms? And I want to emphasize that this is different from the nature-nurture problem. We're not trying to debate how much of circadian biology is inherited and how much can be environmental, nor whether your rhythm is different from my rhythm because of genetic features or environmental features. We're using genetics as an entree into this process. Can we figure out what keeps time by finding mutants which disrupt that process and therefore will provide access to the genes and the proteins which underlie the process. And, and it, to, to emphasize this distinction, let me point out to you that even learning, the ultimate in nurture, if you like, is it relies on proteins and therefore relies on genes. So genetics, genes, proteins are inherent in everything. So I, I turn now to the studies of Konopka and Benzer, who I identified clock mutants uh, of Drosophila melanogaster in this landmark paper published in 1971. So they fed fruit flies mutagens to increase the frequency of mutations and then screened those flies for aberrant circadian properties. And they came up with three mutants uh, in, in a single gene. All three were alleles of one gene, which either gave rise to a, an absent clock, that is no rhythm whatsoever, a short period clock, which ran fast, or a long period clock, which ran slow. And all three of those, as I said, were single mutations, single nucleotide changes in the same protein, which they named period, which suggested, of course, is this protein had some important role in the timekeeping process. But it was really, <clears throat> and here's an example of uh, the wild type circadian pattern on the left, or the per short pattern on the right. And the vertical line refers to the fact that the lights were turned off. And you'll notice that the wild type fly on your left um, keeps very good time during the course of the subsequent days. That is almost exactly 24 hours. Whereas the per short mutant strain every day advances the period by several, advances the beginning of activity by several hours by comparison to the day before very similar to the hamster phenotype, as I said before, only more profound since this animal has a 19 or 20 hour period as contrasted with the almost precise 24 hour period of the wild type. So how does one get at this problem? And there was really almost uh, 15 years between the publication of Kanopka and Benzer and the appearance of recombinant DNA which could be applied to this problem, that is where the period gene could be cloned and sequenced to try to ask what might this gene be doing. And so I was working on recombinant DNA in my laboratory on studies on yeast gene expression. Jeff Hall had not yet adopted this technology. So during one of these basketball games, I suggested to Jeff that we get together, that we collaborate, and that we try to clone this gene, our two laboratories, to see if we could figure out what it was doing. And we did that at the same time Mike Young's laboratory at the Rockefeller University also accomplished the same task. And unfortunately, this protein had, was a pioneer protein, as the expression goes. It had no relatives in the database. These were early days for DNA sequencing. There were a limited number of proteins that had been sequenced and identified. And so we were left still with the question of what this protein did. And it was Paul Harden, in his uh, explorations of the period genes expression where he discovered that the period messenger RNA underwent strong circadian oscillations 
in time. So messenger RNA levels uh, increased and decreased by about a factor of 10 with the precise 24-hour period, even in constant darkness. And remarkably, shown in blue, the per short messenger RNA, different, I, I remind you, by only one single nucleotide from the wild type or normal strain, had only 20 hours between their peaks, just like its behavior um, as compared to this 24-hour difference in the wild type. So the RNA reflected the behavior, and we proposed that the protein must feed back onto its messenger RNA somehow, and that that was intrinsic important for the timing process. But we didn't know at what level this occurred. We didn't know whether this was transcriptional in origin. Uh, yet the, the focus on gene expression was something that I was very familiar with and knew that the half-lives of mRNA, mRNAs in, you, in, in higher organisms were generally in the hours or even tens of hours range, something that was perfect for being related to circadian timing. And then a publication in 1988 by Steve Cruz and colleagues identified a Drosophila transcription factor named single-minded, which had homology with the period protein. And that set us off on, on, a, a, um, on an expedition to rapidly see if transcription was part of the story. And sure enough, within the next two years, we were able to show through several independent kinds of investigation that the period protein was nuclear and that it affected transcription. And, and therefore, we could propose that the feedback loop was direct and was transcriptional in origin. And over the subsequent six years or so, the circadian field really exploded and uh, both identified the positive transcription factor responsible for the synthesis of its negative regulators, um, led, I would say, by Takahashi and his colleagues in mammalian studies, um, followed very quickly by genetic studies in my lab and others. And in addition, uh, people made the leap between flies and mammals, showing, for example, that the period protein was conserved and had a, a, a relative, a very close relative in mammals, which did very similar, if not identical, job. So there was really a, a, a grand synthesis, if you like, and this story has held up for the 17 years since, the, um, since, it's, it's, uh, since 1998. And so the question, the summary, if you will, is, is what do I draw as a, as a personal conclusion from this, uh, from this journey of mine? And, and I would say both from the nature and nurture standpoint, um, I, I've been incredibly lucky. From the nurture point of view, I went to Brandeis almost by accident. It was not a very well-considered decision. And Brandeis has been a wonderful place to do work. Um, I've had great people who have come to my lab. Um, I met Jeff Hall to collaborate. And my colleagues in the administration have been remarkably supportive and allowed me to under, undertake this, this, um, this uh, thrilling uh, enterprise. Uh, the NIH, and, and uh, in particular, HHMI, which has funded me for the last 25 years, uh, have really been uh, a wonderful source of support. HHMI funds people and not projects, um, meaning I could more or less do whatever I wanted and was able to accomplish this. I've had a very supportive family that, despite my obsessions, um, uh, loved me and, and allowed me to pursue this. And, and finally, let me emphasize that even from the nature point of view, whatever talents we individually bring to a problem, uh, those talents, what we inherit from our parents, let, let me say, those parents are not, th those genes are not by choice. Um, we are all victims of accident, in my case, a happy victim. And so it's really uh, good fortune that underlies uh, this story. Thank you very much.